Hi, and welcome to this roundtable dedicated to sustainable aviation. My name is Xavier Titelman. I'm a consultant in aviation for Starburst. Uh, Starburst uh, is a lot of things. That it's an accelerator where a lot of startups come here to go further uh, in, the, in their business development. We also are a consulting company with a great team all around the world, in Asia, in Tel Aviv, in the US, in Europe also, and France, of course, as you can see with my very bad accent. Um, here today, we're very happy to welcome three amazing guests uh, coming from the whole industry. They represent the whole aviation sector with Valérie Guénon. Hi. Hi, Xavier. Emmanuel Cachia. Hi. And Florence Robin. Hi. Hi. Valérie, can you explain who you are? Yes. Uh, so I work for the Safran Group, Safran, uh, aircraft engines and equipment. Uh, I am in charge at Safran Aircraft Engines Company. I am in charge of the environment policy for products. Emmanuel? Hi, so uh, I'm Emmanuel. I work for Transavia, uh, the low cost of uh, Air France, and I'm pilot and uh, flight operation director. On which plane? Yes, on Boeing 737. <laughs> How many planes do you have in Transavia? Uh, today, for this summer, we have 48 airplanes. And how many pilots? Uh, it depends. Uh, every day change because this we summer. have a lot of training. But this summer will be uh, around 500 pilots. In Florence. Hi, um, I'm the CEO and founders of Limatech. Limatech, we develop uh, lithium batteries for aviation. And we are from a CA French lab, and we are 15 people between uh, Grenoble and Toulouse. Okay. Valérie, I think that you're also part of the ATAG. Can you say a word about it? Uh, yes. Uh, so, yeah, I am a member of the board of ATAG. So, ATAG is um, Air Ch um, Transport yes. Action Group. Air Transport Action Group. So, it's a group of um, aviation international industries uh, with uh, airlines, airports, air traffic control, and manufacturers. Great. And can you talk about the aviation commitment toward sustainability? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so, well, aviation commitments, there are several of them. Uh, it's interesting to, um, so I, I, I can mention the international aviation commitments first, and then I can also mention the European commitments. Uh, so, uh, back in 2008, uh, ATAG, so these uh, aviation industries, international aviation industries through ATAG, made a commitment. So, if you remember to it, we were still far from... Uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, there was even an economic, but that's not the subject. And uh, so they realized that we were enjoying quite a very successful traffic growth. Uh, about uh, in the last 20 years, it was about uh, five percent per year. And we realized that if we were going to continue with this traffic growth without doing anything, we, we, if and if we did nothing for CO2, then our carbon footprint would become uh, unacceptable. So uh, these industries made a commitment to reduce their global uh, respect to 2005 and to divide by two overall carbon global carbon emissions due to civil aviation. So that was a very historic despite commitment. the growth. Despite the growth, yes. Of course, our objective was to. Uh, enable the growth, uh, to, but to make it sustainable. We, we want people to, to travel, we want to, uh, to, to have, a, you know, more aircraft in, in the sky, but it has to be sustainable. So that was the, uh, the commitment. And then, but these were only the uh, private uh, sector commitments, so companies, industries. Um, and then you have the ICAO, the um, International Civil Aviation Organization, that is a group of member states, 193 member states. Uh, and this inspired ICAO to also make a commitment, and at that time the commitment was a little bit less, um, it's more difficult to agree between 193 states, of course, than between 20 companies. Um, so, uh, but they did make a commitment, and in particular they uh, created Corsia, uh, so, Corsia means stands for carbon offset and reduction. 
sitting scheme. And that was also quite historical because um, all these countries, uh, ICAO is a United Nations organization, all these countries agreed to commit and so that uh, all CO2 emissions that would be above uh, the 2019-2020. So uh, th that's a commitment that is um, quite unique. It's quite in unique. The whole industry, right? It's it's quite unique because the airlines commit to pay to 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 pay offsets for um, carbon emissions, basically. Make it some. Uh, so that was also quite quite uh, impressive. Um, and then and now I can now currently working on a long term goal for CO two global reduction. Uh, it's taking uh, two years. Well, it started last year and it will be delivered in 2022 at the next ICAO assembly. And all these member states will also agree on reducing the CO2 emissions for 2050. Or It's, it's still under progress. It's being um, uh, un under discussion. So very difficult discussions because we are many countries with, with, with many different situation economic situations and so on uh so that's for if you leave me some time i, I don't want to take all the time but if you <laughs> as long as you need <laughs> um so then if we can word about europe uh so um first of all europe uh, back in 2001 europe had set some objectives they are called they are known as the carry objectives uh, and at the time, it was objectives for reducing CO2, NOx, noise, so not only climate aspects. The global the, environment. The, the, the total environment uh, impact. And those objectives were but for t based on technology, so they were per passenger kilometer. It was not the same metric, but already at the time, they had identified uh, the environment as uh, a challenge that aviation had to address for the next 20 years and next 50 years. Uh, now, in Europe, what's going on now? Uh, if you are European citizens, you may remember that you voted in 19, uh, in, uh, sorry, 2019. So you voted for the new European Parliament. And so this Parliament was renewed and then it uh, created a new commission. And this new commission has set up its policy vision. Uh, which is based, among others, on the Green Deal. So if you heard about the Green Deal, uh, this is something that, as European citizens, is going to change our lives. Uh, back in March, the European Union, so Council, Parliament, uh, Commission, agreed on the Green Deal objective, climate objective, which is carbon neutrality in 2050. So in the European Union, we are aiming at carbon neutrality in 2050, and this will go through an intermediate step of minus 55% reduction. So 55% reduction in 2013, 30, so 2030, so nine years from now, so tomorrow. So um, minus 55% with respect to the 1990 levels. Uh, so that is absolutely historical. It has not made the big head headlines, I have to say, when I read the news, but okay. So, and the uh, European Aviation is also getting prepared for that. And they have uh, made, um, we have, uh, because I, we contributed as a Saffron, uh, a roadmap, uh, which is called Destination 2050, which is available and uh, um, which describes how we are going to reach carbon neutrality also as the European aviation. Voila. <laughs> Great. And we see that, okay, you have a uh, right, uh, lots of things to do, but a lot of things has been done already. Uh, we see that uh, about 50% reduction in the fuel efficiency for the passenger uh, about the last 30 years. So, uh, Emmanuel, as a pilot in Transavia, Transavia is one of the most efficient airlines in the world. You were fifth on the uh, uh, classement, je sais pas comment on dit. Uh, how, merci. How did you manage to be such efficient? Uh, thank you, Xavier. Yes, it's true that uh, we are a bit lucky in Transavia because from the beginning, from from 
since the first flight of Transavia in May 2007, the fuel conservation, fuel efficiency uh, is in our NDA. So it is a culture in our airline. So we start with a uh, uh, lot of best practice uh, at the beginning and we work uh, year after year to be better. And today, uh, it is uh, natural when we have a project to think how we can reduce our uh, fuel uh, uh, consumption, sorry, and uh, how we can reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, today, all the staff are very involved, particularly the pilots. As you know, we have a lot of best practice that we can apply every day when we fly. And today, uh, so as soon as the first hour in our airline, uh, during the welcome day, uh, the chief pilot or I uh, present our uh, fuel policy and the interest of it. There is economical interest, it's true, but today uh, I, we, we are sure that the ecological, ecological interest is uh, the most important. Uh, as Valerie has uh, present uh, at the beginning, we have a lot of goal today and we know that it is monetary for in our industry for the airs uh, so uh, we uh, have the challenge to 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 succeed and now so we work with all the team to 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 reduce our fuel consumption uh, concerning the eco flying so uh, today uh, the pilots are uh, so involved by a lot of best practice and uh, the first one uh, is uh, the fuel uh, that we uh, decide to have in our tank uh, just before the flight. So uh, today, the policy of Transavia is to have the minimum fuel. Uh, we can say that because we know that our flight plan, operational flight plan, are very uh, efficient, are reliable, the pilots are confident in that. And so uh, we uh, can manage a minimum fuel according to the weather, according to all the safety uh, that we can... You still have a 30 minutes uh, reserve, right? The re regulation, but in the past, uh, sometimes, uh, because we know the airports, so we wanted to have more fuel, but in fact, we have discovered that it's not necessary. So today, uh, all the pilots, their policy is to, to have the minimum fuel uh, when it's, uh, it's possible for sure. Uh, the second one is uh, the reduced access altitude. So uh, when it's possible, because some airport is not possible, but today we can have a reduced accession altitude at uh, 1,000 or 1,500 feet. And uh, we, with this uh, best practice today on our Boeing 737, we can reduce the consumption of 25 kilograms per flight. So it seems to be very low, 25 kilograms, but uh, like all the best practice that I will uh, uh, present today, uh, the result is done by the number of flights. That is very important. Uh, so uh, we work on the taxi out with uh, one engine only, uh, on the continuous descent approach, and uh, we have a global uh, um, vision of the fuel reduction, and so we work on the weight reduction of the aircraft too. So uh, today when we uh, uh, expect to uh, to buy a new trolley or uh, new seats. We are looking for the lighter one. And uh, today, also a uh, few, few few weeks ago, we decided to change the carpet of the aircraft. And uh, with the changement, we can reduce the consumption per flight of about nine kilograms. But in a full year like 2019, this reduction for Transavia is around 400 tons of fuel, so uh, only with the new carpet. Uh, we wash our engine, so we follow a lot of the recommendations that we can uh, read in uh, ICAO or Boeing. Uh, so uh, wash, wash the, the, the engine, uh, use of uh, GPU, uh, uh, so on the ground power unit instead of auxiliary power unit in the, in the aircraft. And we work with a lot of startups uh, to develop uh, uh, new best practice, uh, if we can. So we have developed uh, with a uh, safety line. Uh, so we are a partner. And uh, so we are the launch airline uh, of uh, the tool OptiClimb. So it's a tool which uses uh, big data. And uh, before each flight, uh, this tool uh, uh, optimizes the climb with the speeds. 
uh, according to uh, the weather of the day, the wind, uh, the white of the aircraft. And with, uh, with this tool on Boeing 737, we can uh, reduce uh, our consumption uh, around 80 kilograms per flight. So it's quite a lot because uh, when we have all the other eco, uh, all the other best practices like uh, taxi out on one engine, like uh, reduction altitude, what I have uh, presented, uh, optic climb only is around 80 kilograms, uh, and the other ones, all the other ones, is today in Transavia 45 kilograms. Uh, for us, what was important from the beginning is to to have a vision of of the result of this policy. And so uh, we met uh, uh, in 2011 uh, Alexandre Ferret, the CEO of, uh, uh, of uh, sorry, uh, Open Airlines, uh, and uh, we uh, exposed, we discussed with him, and uh, he understood that we have a, a need how we can see the result of our policy, because in 2011 we are totally blind. We had a policy, the pilots applied this policy, but it was well applied. Uh, what are the results? We didn't know. So he has developed with his team uh, a tool. Uh, it is uh, so SkyBreeze. And today, uh, with this tool, the management could have a global vision of the fuel policy in the airline. And that is very important for us to involve the pilots because we can see, uh, okay, this one is well done, but this one, we have a lot of uh, uh, of fuel uh, of fuel saving that we can reach so how we can reach this fuel saving so we work on our communication or sometimes we change our procedure to be better and uh, so uh, to have better results uh, and the pilots uh, have the same tool but with the personal results so management we don't have personal results it's totally uh, confidential but the pilots could have uh, his personal result, it's, it's a mean for us uh, to involve the pilots in this, uh, in this goal and in this policy. Congratulations. Uh, you mentioned Open Airlines and Safety Line. Just uh, both of those startups have been accelerated by Star yeah. Starburst. So let's continue with them. Uh, just a question about, I think that you're about uh, the consumption per passenger is about 2 liters, 2.3 liters per passenger. Yes, like with human. all this, uh, this, this work, so with the uh, best practice of the pilots, the light trolley, carpet, everything, uh, today the consumption, so the last full year in 2019, uh, the consumption per passenger per kilometers, uh, 100 kilometers. per 100 kilometers, sorry, is uh, 2.6 uh, liters uh, per passenger, yes. So okay. it's quite it's quite good. And today, uh, we are still working uh, with, with uh, startups or, or with, uh, with other uh, subcontractors to, 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 to be better in this consumption. And since 2011, we have reduced this uh, consumption and our carbon footprint by uh, 14% uh, with uh, with all these eco flying, which is huge, in comparison to the Europe, to the French average, it's a 3.4 liter per passenger per 100 kilometers. So it's much better than the average. Quite good. Thank Keep you. Going, <laughs> Valérie. We've seen that there's a lot of things, thanks to optimization of the operations, and on the technological point of view, uh, what are the next steps? Yes. Um, yeah. I. If I may, I, because what Emmanuel said um, um, triggered an idea that I want to share. I mentioned the uh, roadmaps and the objectives. And all these roadmaps and objectives, uh, the ATAG roadmap, the Destination 2050, the ICAO thinking, uh, they are slightly different, but they all rely on the same levers. And those lever technology, flight operations, that you mentioned, and there is also the um, load factor, I think that's quite important. Um, ATM improvement, um, the use of new types of energy, so sustainable aviation fuels, and in the last, uh, for, for what is what remains, uh, uh, and, and really those levers are really the same. There is a consensus on, on that, and we need to do so, these aspects. So yeah, for the technology, uh, so of course we've been working on technology for the last 50 years. Ever since aircraft existed, we improved the technology and we improved the fuel consumption. Uh, so uh, we, we work uh, uh, on the fuel consumption 
at first because it was an economic incentive for us, for the airlines, for our customers. Um, and uh, we also have uh, very much improved our uh, environment footprint through noise and polluting emissions because of the um, international regulations. We have to comply with the regulations. So, uh, so how, how did we do that? Um, so the, the first of all, the weight. So you mentioned the weight of the carpets, <laughs> which is extremely important, of course. So we have been working on the weight. And so the weight, reducing the weight is, is, is the first um, objectives. And uh, in the last 30 years, uh, the use of composite materials, ha composite materials has been really, uh, has brought a revolution, actually. Uh, so we continue. It's not only working on materials in general, using materials that are lighter with the same mechanical properties. Uh, so uh, this is really something we continue. There is still room for improvement. And there is a new revolution that is coming after composite. It's the uh, additive manufacturing that allows us to uh, uh, to design parts that we could not design before. So we can design a parts that will be more efficient, lighter. Uh, it's also a revolution in the production processes and everything, of, of course. So weight, uh, the uh, aircraft manufacturers, they work on the aerodynamics of the aircraft, of course, the improvement has been made also there. I have to speak about the engine technologies, of course, because the engine is the part of the aircraft that produces CO2 out of the noise. <laughs> um, so engine technology is extremely important. We have made, um, well, the engine, there is an evolution of the engines, in particular the increase of what we call the bypass ratio, which makes bigger engines. Uh, and You've just signed a new agreement. Yes. Which are the goals? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We ten days ago, yeah. CFM announced. So the the mother companies of CFM, which are Safran Aircraft Engines and General Electric Aviation, GE Aviation, announced uh, the next generation of engine, which is called Rise. It's the Rise project, uh, and uh, so it will be um, an, a new engine architecture that will bring an additional 20% fuel reduction with respect to the LEAP engine, which is currently really the state of the art. And the LEAP engine itself um, has, um, demonstrates 15% fuel reduction with respect to the previous generation. So we are continuing. We know how to do it. It's becoming more and more challenging, more and more difficult from the technology point of view. But we know how to do it and we're continuing. And the last, uh, well, the last one is not technology, but technology is, is, is uh, uh, concerned by it. Uh, it's the use of new types of energies, of course, and sustainable aviation fuels, electricity, hydrogen. And when we're looking at the full scope of CO2 emissions by the, in the aviation sector, in the aviation industry, we're also thinking about the, the factories. Safran has a lot of factories. Do you improve them also? Of course, yes. We have a big project called the, C, uh, the Low Carbon Project, uh, which is uh, addressing specifically the uh, greenhouse gases emissions of our facilities, our factory, our industry. Uh, and so, yeah, we do have uh, um, actions such as uh, photovoltaic uh, production of electricity, eco generation, wind turbines, uh, and uh, we are working now on um, using sustainable aviation fuel, so based on biofuel based, for um, our um, test benches, uh, for our um, engine test benches. We use uh, um, 80,000 tons uh, of um, 
Yeah, sorry, no, I, I 18. 18, 18. Okay. No, 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 no. Thousand no, pounds no, was no, a lot. No, no, no. <laughs> um, no eight, uh, sorry. Oh, okay, forget the, the number. But we so we use a lot of uh, uh, kerosene for our uh, test things. benches, and so we aim at using ten percent of sustainable aviation fuels at the end of this year, and uh, to go up to thirty-five percent uh, in twenty twenty-five. Great, thank you, Florence. We heard uh, Valérie explaining all the future options one of them is the electrification and you produce amazing batteries uh, what are the targets for you yes um, concerning uh, electrification in aviation we identified three steps and uh, step one is to replace uh, old batteries uh, with um, uh, lighter and less polluting batteries and at uh, Limatec, uh, we develop uh, lithium batteries uh, three times lighter and two times less maintenance and with a 10 years lifespan. And uh, the step two is uh, hybridation uh, engines. For the moment, uh, hydrogen is the best way. And the for the step three, uh, for full electric uh, propulsion, uh, we uh, already work on um, uh, high voltage uh, batteries. And for uh, all these three steps, uh, uh, um, they, they need batteries and Limatec will be ready. <laughs> so you're telling that your batteries could be lighter. Uh, we didn't mention it in detail, but when we save 100 kilograms on an aircraft, we save about three kilograms of fuel per hour. And how many kilograms will you save, for example, on a Boeing 737 or A320? Uh, for example, for uh, NAE 320, uh, uh, we can save 120 kilo. Um, and it's uh, uh, the benefits is really important uh, for market players. Okay, of course, because it will save hundreds of kilograms of fuel per year per, per plane. Yes. Of course. Great. And uh, are the next is this next generation of battery less harmful for human or environment? Yes, um, it's um, uh, we replace uh, lead or nickel cadmium uh, technology in the batteries with uh, lithium uh, technology batteries, and lithium it's uh, no toxic uh, against lead or, or um, nickel cadmium. We don't get cancer. Yes. Okay, to be clear. <laughs> Okay, that's the main improvement for human life also and for the whole uh, value chain, right? Yes, and um, uh, in 2020, we were selected by the European uh, Council Innovation um, for the new Green Deal uh, program, as uh, very said in the beginning. <laughs> okay, that's great. So you're working already with some industrial uh, big companies? Yes, uh, for example, uh, Airbus. Okay, that's a big one. <laughs> And uh, I hope with Saffron. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll sign a deal yeah. after the talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Emmanuel, do you see some other, uh, for example, Valérie talked about the improvement of the ATC. In your point of view, uh, is well, first, what do you expect from the improvement of the ATC? And do you see any, any other lever? Uh, yes. Uh, we, 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 with uh, every day with uh, the flight, we can see that we have today an improvement uh, possible. We can reach uh, uh, reduction, fuel reduction uh, with uh, uh, new ATC procedures That's for sure. We can see, uh, for example, uh, on our flight plane, the, the, the routes are not direct, so we have a lot of route that. Uh, we have points, but these points is not a line, so it's not straight. Uh, the other uh, point that we can, uh, uh, on which we can have better result is uh, with a continued descent approach. Uh, uh, the results and and what we can uh, exp when we can see every day is that it's very different uh, in uh, in the country in, in Europa. So uh, sometimes it's very easy to have a continued descent approach. Sometimes it's more difficult. It's true that when the airport is uh, uh, with a lot of traffic, it's more difficult to have uh, something continuous. So it was easier in the past few months. Yes, for sure. Yes, for sure. For sure. Uh, and for example, because it is our experience, huh, we, we, we have a lot of aircraft based in Paris. And it's true that when we arrive in Paris, the, the beginning of the descent is very early. If 
our flight plan, we have a descent about uh, uh, 80 nautical miles before the, the, the airport. Uh, when we arrive in a big airport, it could be 200 nautical miles due to uh, the procedure, uh, the, the arrival that uh, is, is mandatory for 40 airports. So uh, we can have a lot of, uh, true, we, we say we can have a lot of uh, progress. Because you try to glide? It's like this, yes, we have a full idle. So the, the aircraft today are very uh, well equipped and uh, with the automatism, we just have uh, to, to, everything is uh, in the, our uh, uh, computer on board and uh, the aircraft, uh, we have full idle on the, on, on the engine. And so only with, uh, with the energy we descend. And so the, the consumption during all the sun is very low, very low. It's, uh, I don't know exactly, but it's very low. We, it's quite, quite zero, quite. Uh, and so, uh, when it's well done, and we can see with uh, with our tool, with uh, with, with Scaleway, Scaleway, that uh, on a lot of airports is well done because uh, the process could be like this. But uh, today we have a lot of uh, uh, opportunity uh, on other airports. And today, it's not easy. But to be totally frank, the discussion is beginning. Is beginning on this on this subject. Okay, let's go. Um, we see that you have a lot of opportunities to save fuel. Is it just because of greed? We want to save money or is there some just ecological uh, perspective? Uh, for sure, the money is, is a fact. But as I, I told you at the beginning, uh, we know and Valerie has very well explained uh, what is our target and what is uh, uh, the vision of our industry. We know that we have to be better. We know that uh, uh, the growth, we, we need aircraft today, and we know that we have to be better to, 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 to be still, to, to still have this industry in the future. So, uh, for example, we are low cost, but uh, we are an airline, and uh, in the past, uh, sometimes uh, we uh, ask our pilots to have a, a economical fuel. It is a fuel that we know that it's necessary to, to, to tank, uh, because uh, the fuel at the airport uh, at arrival is very the price is very high so we 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 have fuel just to tank the fuel because the the, the, the price is very high at uh, at our just station. to avoid to buy for example ajaxio is quite expensive in regard of all the other airports around i don't know if ajaxio is quite expensive but it's an example yes and so instead of buying it at ajaxio some airlines come to ajaxio with the full tanks yes and so they not buy it or to, to have to 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 buy the the less quantity at uh, at the airport where the fuel is very high so it it was a uh, a pratique in the past, hein, the tokering fuel, it was the name. And today we have uh, totally uh, forbidden. And today, today uh, we don't have any tokering fuel uh, in Transavia. So you save fuel? We save fuel, and, but, but it we don't save money. money. Uh, it's it's money. So, but still today, I think maybe you, uh, you will correct me. Uh, fuel tokering is still uh, 900,000 tons of CO2 emitted every year in Europe. So I hope the, all the other airlines will follow your very good example. Thank you. Um, we've talked about, uh, you've talked about changing the carpets. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you imagine having some new uh, batteries in the next future? Yes, uh, for sure. Because uh, as I told you, uh, we have a list of uh, points that could uh, uh, reduce the fuel consumption and the weight is very important. And so if tomorrow we have a new battery, uh, uh, with a lot of reduction, so more than 100 kilograms per bell. Uh, it's, it's huge. It's huge. Uh, so yes, why not? And when will you be ready to go on the market? Yes, um, we will sign the agreement just after right. the agreement. It's a good day for <laughs> you. <Just after. laughs> okay, um, we'll be ready uh, to sell in 2023. Okay, so it's quite fast. Well, it's uh, tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow. Yeah. That's signed. That's true. Um, you've been talking about the sustainable fuel. It has a cost. Yes, it's much more expensive than current uh, kerosene. Do you have an idea of how much it will, it will be? Um, yeah, well, th th that's you are raising the main uh, challenge for sustainable aviation fuels currently, yes. Uh, the, the challenge is not so much technology challenge, but it's really the availability cost. No, three times more, four times more than kerosene. A kerosene is fantastic. Kerosene has all the um, all what we want. Uh, 
with kerosene. They were all designed for kerosene. Using sustainable aviation fuel is really a revolution and is really going to ask us a, a, a tremendous change. Uh, so, um, yeah, the main challenge is the availability and the cost goes together with the availability. Just because, to be clear, yeah. uh, SAF don't use uh, palm oil, we don't use uh, what is not sustainable. So it's only uh, from garbage waste, from uh, crops so that, that were not used. So to be clear, there's no concurrence between SAF and food or the nature. It's really another way to okay. produce and that's why it's expensive also. Uh, absolutely, you are right. What SAF means, sustainable aviation fuels <laughs> and so sustainable means that there is no deforestation no killing animals uh, no uh, bringing people into poverty or no competition with with food so absolutely you, you're right and there are uh, criteria that are strictly defined and they are approved by the ico to say uh, if uh, such type of production is sustainable. So yes, and that's of course one of the reasons why they are expensive. It's not the only reason, but it's also one it's a fundamental uh, criteria and we uh, will be absolutely uh, uh, adamant and, and, and will not uh, comply with this uh, aspect indeed. And what is the reduction of the fuel emission, the CO2 emission on the global circle? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, because the thing, yeah, on the uh, full life cycle, you're right. So the question is, uh, because SAF, if you burn SAF, SAF is a fuel, and so you burn it and you create CO2. You, you do it when you fly with the SAF. Uh, the question is, uh, so you have to look at the overall cycle, life cycle, uh, and the, uh, the principle of the SAF is that you uh, emit CO2 that has been uh, absorbed before by the plant. Or uh, it burn, let's say, garbage, uh, because there are stuff that can be used out of, of yeah, um, uh, garbage. <laughs> um, then you burn uh, for flying instead of burning for disposal of the garbage. Uh, so that you have to uh, address the full uh, life cycle of, of uh, the product. For example, the oil from the fast food. Yes, that's an example. It. Yes, yes. So let's say it's French fries. It's yeah. good for the environment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, instead of being incinerated. Yes, yes. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if that answered your that's question. A, that's the question. Okay. And is it main issue for you? I mean, if, okay, you made good example, for example, about fuel tankering you don't practice fuel tankering but if you buy SAF and that your uh, op opponent uh, don't use it is it a big issue for you and how can you uh, reduce those differences uh, today the, the SAF uh, is a regulation it will be a regulation in France uh, on the 1st January 2022 we have to, to, to uh, introduce 1% of SAF in our uh, fuel uh, and uh, we'll have the ROP uh, regulation uh, in the mid of July. Uh, so it is a regulation, uh, as all the carrier will uh, follow this regulation. Uh, the, 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 the fact today, the problem for, for, for all the carrier, I think, in, in France and in Europe at more, is the supply chain and, and, and the, the production of this stuff uh, today. Uh, so uh, Air France has done uh, uh, the first long haul flight with SAF uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the, the supply of this SAF was very difficult. So it's one uh, uh, one tank coming from uh, somewhere in France. It's, it's not easy to to have SAF on an airport. So uh, today, that's uh, the first point: is uh, how we can have uh, an, an industrialization of this production and and so industrialization of the supply. Uh, the second point is the price, but today, so the production is very low, the price is very high. We expect and uh, that the price will be lower with a, a higher production. Uh, but uh, today, it's yes, it's between three and five times more expensive. Uh, so at the beginning, it's only one percent. It will be five percent in 2030. Uh, so 
will manage this price like a cost, like all the costs that we could have in, a, in, in an airline. But it will be a rule, so we'll follow this rule like uh, all the competitors. It's true that it could be a distortion competition uh, with other actors, other airlines outside Europa. So let's hope that the regulation will have to implement the same level of staff for every airline. We expect so because uh, it's good for the earth and it is the, the goal of this, this, uh, this regulation. So to... that's all. Florence, you've talked about the retrofit of small or big aircraft, but what are the uh, perspective for the battery for you? Yes, um, for step two and three, uh, hybridization and uh, full electric, uh, electric propulsion, um, it's uh, for this new market in aviation, it's quite difficult to estimate uh, this market. But uh, as the automobile sector, I think it will be grow similar and um, it will be progressive. Uh, it will first concern um, aircraft uh, with a smaller capacity of passenger, um, like intercity or um, uh, urban mobility with uh, commuters and uh, EVTOL. And several uh, companies are were already working on the drones or um, air taxi, uh, like uh, Volocopters, Lilium, there are a lot in the world. But today, the, the most important objective in the world is to reduce uh, carbon dioxide. And with, uh, uh, for the first step uh, with Limatec, uh, we'll be we will certify our batteries in 2022 and uh, we'll sell it in 2023 and um, uh, this is a go to market and we will uh, um, uh, make and uh, and sell 30,000 batteries uh, per year in 2028 and for that uh, we built a big factory um, with free line of uh, production and um, uh, we will be able on this uh, market, it's a um, um, uh, thermal engine market uh, for OEM and retrofit, we will be able uh, to save 1 million ton of CO2 in just five years of sales. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, great news. Uh, when you're talking, well, just to give uh, huge numbers, uh, it's about 10,000 commuters expected to be on the ground. Uh, in 2035 and about 15,000 eVTOL. So it will be also a uh, lot of work for you on the engine uh, point of view. Uh, do you believe in electrification of the aircraft as a propulsion? Oh, yeah. Well, not only we believe in it, but we work on it, of course, yes. Well, we, we've, we've worked on the electrification of the aircraft from non-propulsive functions for the last 20 years already. And uh, so, yeah, we do have some uh, projects with, um, in particular, our company, um, Saffron Electrical and Power, they're working on uh, powering, uh, 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 yeah, powering uh, small aircraft. No, regional aircraft. Do you believe in 2035 we'll have a 70 seater fully electric? Well, we believe it will be. Um, we, we will start with small vehicles. So, oh. typically, uh, as Florence said, uh, typically EVTOLs or helicopters or small, small. Commuters. Yeah, it's commuters. Yes, that, that, that is the first step. Uh, then, you know, it. If we get to uh, larger aircraft, then we have uh, other solutions that that we are thinking about that we are preparing. So there will be a limit, probably an upper limit to the size of aircraft that can be uh, powered with electricity. Great. Emmanuel, uh, what about the young pilots? How do you teach them to be eco-friendly? Uh, as I told you, uh, so, uh... It's, uh, when they arrive in our airline, so we explain them the, the fuel policies, the best practices, and, and how you can reduce uh, the, the fuel consumption. And, and uh, all these practices are teach during the training, so uh, at the simulator, in flight. And uh, so it is like this in Transavia. Today, it, 
I think that for all the pilots, it is it, it is a competence that uh, must be uh, teach and develop uh, in a small uh, school when we start uh, to fly. So uh, and and after in in the airline. So uh, and, and today uh, we can see that uh, this uh, uh, electrification of the aircraft has already started uh, on uh, the, the small aircraft. So in, in the school. Uh, uh, in the flying school, sorry, and and so today, uh, so the, the pilots uh, start today with a new technology and with the the the, the culture of uh, uh, of the reduction of the carbon footprint. Because last year, the first fully electric plane was uh, granted the allowance to fly in Europe, and it's a two seater, so it's very good for uh, young pilots learning in school, right? Ah, yes, certainly, because they can discover the new technology. Maybe the technology, the, sorry, the technology of their future aircraft uh, when we'll start uh, in in an airline. Are you ready for the next generation of aircraft? Yes, we are ready because we are You're expecting. Uh, yeah, we're expecting. We we are pilots, so we like to 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 pilot new aircraft, new technology, and it will be certified, so it will be totally safe. Thank you. Now. Uh, let's introduce uh, the video with Ampere, Ampere, which is an amazing company. Maybe you will give them uh, batteries also, and I come back to us after that. I'm Benjamin, the program director of the Starburst Accelerator. Today, you're going to hear a discussion between my colleague Xavier Talman and Kevin Nordker. Kevin is the founder and CEO of Ampere, a startup developing hybrid electric aircrafts, who was part of our very first cohort in 2018. Since then, they've made amazing progress. Um, they've hired a world-class team. They booked a pre-order backlog. They've fl flown the aircraft extensively, and they've raised an additional round of venture financing. In February, they announced being acquired by um, Surfair, a regional aerial mobility service provider in a deal valuing the company at $100 million. We've been very pleased to work with the founders um, at the very early stage and continue to support Kevin and his team in making electric aviation a reality. Now, let's hear the update on Ampere's project. I am the co-founder and CEO of Ampere. Okay. And when did we start? <laughs> when did we start? We founded the company in early 2016. Okay, so five years uh, already? Yeah. Over five years now, yeah, it's been um, it, it's been amazing. And actually, I met the Starburst team in uh, in twenty seventeen okay. was when I first when I first met them. Actually, so it was uh, we've been and then I think we formally joined or something structured in twenty eighteen. But like, it's been a long time. It's and it's incredible uh, yeah. just how how yeah. So, Kevin, what are the main advantages of a hybrid electric aircraft? Well, when we think about a hybrid electric aircraft or really electrified airplanes in general, there are two primary value propositions, benefits that they bring. Number one, we're able to reduce the fuel burn, which directly reduces the, the, the direct emissions of those planes. So it's the, the noise emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions, the pollution emissions. Um, these are These are things where you can see that immediate benefit from switching over to the hybridized or fully electric propulsion. And then of course, when you're reducing the cost of, of fuel too, so you're using electricity instead of your combustion fuel, um, and you're simplifying the systems, your maintenance gets lighter. Now all of a sudden you can actually save some, some money too and actually improve the economics of the operation. So, so switching over to hybrid brings those benefits. It's a partial step toward fully electric, but one of the other benefits that hybrid brings above fully electric is that hybrid is, is able to be really useful immediately. There are only a few circumstances where a fully electric plane is viable. It's generally on the smaller. It's like the, the two seaters or four seaters currently that can be flown uh, fully electric. But if you're trying to do a commercial transport class plane, that hybridization really enables you to have meaningful payload, meaningful range, meaningful speed, while still getting some of those electrification benefits. So those are the, the key for, for hybridization. Sustainable aviation fuel is one of, the, one of the many solutions within the ecosystem of sustainable solutions for aviation. So absolutely, when we're architecting our hybrid systems, we want those systems to be able to fly 
on sustainable aviation fuels as well. Um, we think that hybridization may actually be one of the ways that sustainable aviation fuels can be made affordable, which it, when, when just used pure sustainable aviation fuel, it's, it's quite expensive currently, but with hybridization, maybe that balances out and is a, is a better economic value for the, uh, for the operators. And can you measure the improvement that you had thanks to hybridization? Well, of course, the, the, the improvements are quite simple to measure. Um, so first, we, we deployed a plane and flew on routes, daily routes out in Hawaii last year. And this plane, an upgrade of a Cessna Skymaster, we call it an electric eel, uh, twin engine, hybrid electric. And we were saving just over 30% of the fuel on average over the course of all of those flights. And so you think 30% fuel saving, now that's pretty significant. That's huge. And is it thanks to the shape of your plane or thanks to hybridization? So this is just thanks to the hybridization. Uh, the plane itself is an older model that all was originally combustion. And we have taken that plane, pulled out one of the combustion engines and upgraded it to this hybrid electric configuration. And so, uh, so it is less the aerodynamics because those stay very similar to the original airplane. And more so, it's just how the propulsion systems operate. And that's why we think that there's a lot of value that can be brought in upgrading existing planes. Of course, that lays a foundation for the clean sheet design planes that we all love and want to bring into the, into the market in the far future. Okay, so clearly, Ampere is leading the way to the hybrid electric planes. And maybe for the more massive planes, the biggest one, uh, how long could it take to make a 100-seater hybrid electric plane? Well, I think what we're going to see is those larger planes, the hundred seaters and, and up become more electric, replacing cer certain key components with electrified versions of those components. You may even see hybrid electric variants or, or, um, or upgrades to those planes where it's kind of a soft hybrid using a little bit of electricity in certain cases. Um, I think we're going to see hybrids of those planes demonstrated by probably 2030, I think would be very reasonable, maybe even sooner. Um, now, when would we actually see them in market commercially? I think that might be a little further out. I think we'll first see kind of the 30, 50, 75 type passenger planes in this, in this decade get closer to commercialization. But there's still some pretty significant regulatory uh, technology and uh, and 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 ultimately uh, certification, like kind of overall performance uh, challenges that are going to be needed to overcome in order to get those larger planes. So we are working hard to go get our uh, our certification. That's a supplemental type certification by the uh, end of 23 or early 2024. So you're looking just a few years down the road when we believe we'll be able to get that approval. Now that is a an ambitious but pretty realistic timeline, we believe, to actually getting this upgraded plane into market, into customer hands, and to really be bringing these benefits. And when was your first flight? So our first flight was in uh, May of 2019. So a little over two years ago. In fact, no, it, it's just almost two years ago to the day. I think it was May May 22nd. So, um, so yeah, I, uh, we've been flying for, for two years now. That's very great. Kevin, thanks you very much for the interview. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Good luck. We intend to be the first in the country to put passengers on hybrid electric aircraft. And these guys are leading the technology revolution in that sphere. You know, as with all airlines, the cost of fuel is one of our biggest expenses. So as we look for different areas where we can control costs and lower the price for the consumer, cutting the cost of fuel and power is a much greater option for us than trying to control other costs like labor and infrastructure. That's great. Thank you. Congratulations, Ampère. Uh, when we see that, okay, we see that's a new era for aviation. Uh, it saves 60% uh, of the operational cost thanks to fuel reduction and thanks to maintenance. Uh, 
easier maintenance. Uh, do you think that here in France, in Europe, we get the right amount of support for developing such technologies? Yeah, uh, so you, you mean public support, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, public support for this type of, we're talking about new technologies, we're talking about technology risks, we're talking about financial risks as well. And for whether it's for more electrical aircraft or for more, you know, any type of research and technology that we do on the aircraft, aerodynamics, uh, new engines, uh, all sorts of studies, uh, we um, we get support. We we get public support. Uh, we get support from. Uh, national support from our states so here we are in france we get support from the french um, government uh, and we also get support from the european union and so what why is this support absolutely necessary it's not just a question of saying we, we take the money and and run <laughs> uh, it's uh, because uh talking about those techno technology and financial risks which we would not take the the the, the regular market would normally say well don't, don't take this risk so uh the public support helps this risk because the risk we take it also sure is not it's uh, the, you know in, in political will uh, so that's the first reason. And the second reason, and it's particularly true in Europe, is that all the efforts have been coordinated. And what Europe has done uh, in the last 30 years is that it has forced us um, to work together to create uh, networks, technology networks, excellence networks to work. And, and, and in particular, um, that's what the... Um, a research program called Clean Sky, which is the Euro big European research program we created back in um, in, in the mid 2000s. Um, this is what it's doing. It's it's uh, you you know 800 partners participate in Clean Sky. 800 European partners participate. So uh, so you need public support to to do such. Uh, it, it, it's really very impressive, but you need the public support, the, the public uh, also um, incentives and sometimes obligations. Uh, and of course, uh, 2020 was a special year because we had the COVID crisis, which was unprecedented and totally historical. But uh, in France, we got this um, uh, recovery plan, which is absolutely necessary, not only for research, but in all areas, of course, for for um, uh, for our sector. Uh, but there is uh, an, a research support branch of this recovery plan, which is extremely important. And we have committed to work on a future green aviation. So it's also part of it. Yeah. Bruno Karak also. Corac is the organization that uh, establishes these these uh, it, it establishes the directions and the in the national roadmaps. Yes. Okay. The support comes from the uh, Ministry of Transport. Okay. Thank you. For so let's be clear: the golden era of aviation is coming thanks to sustainability, thanks to innovation. So you you'll be part of it, and we'll see you in a couple of years as to how far to see how far we've gone. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks to you for following us. Uh, thank you, Valérie from Safran, Emmanuel from Transavia, Florence from Limatec. Uh, tonight, don't forget, we have at 5 p.m. French time, Paris time, uh, a, a roundtable about uh, space. It will be amazing also. Thank you, everybody. Merci à vous. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Au revoir. Au revoir.